Hi everybody, this is Raimi like Do Raimi, best-selling author of Living Life as an Exclamation Point. And today we're talking to Brandon Pipkin. I want to be sure that I get that name right. He's an author of 21 Questions for 21 Millionaires, How Ordinary People Create Extraordinary Success. And you know, I went to his website at 21for21.com and he opens with a really bold statement. He says, here's the truth about success. The success experts are wrong, dead wrong. Hi, Brandon. Good to see you. Hey, Ramey. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing excellent. That Good. is a bold statement. It is. Yeah. So tell us about what you've going on, got going on. Tell us a little bit about your book and, and uh, how you're so daring. <laughs> Great. Well, the reason I'm so daring is that uh, I bought and believed everything those experts were telling me for up to 10 years. It was about seven years into my personal quest for success, personal development, wealth, leadership, etc., that I came across a thought that I thought would springboard me to my success. Because previous to that point, I had studied everything the authors and gurus had to offer and tried to do everything I could to be successful. So I set goals. I had plans. I had to set a plan and work your plan and tell people what your goals are so that they can hold you accountable. I mentored with somebody. I put up pictures on my dream board. I did everything the experts say you're supposed to do to be successful. And it didn't work. Instead of happiness untold, I had a lot of frustration. And I had a lot of debt too. But I came across a thought which was if you find your passion, you can find your success. Yeah. So I thought, wow, that's it. I will interview 21 millionaires to see how and why they found their passion mm -hmm. and created their success because of that. And then I can inspire other people to do the same. I love that. Yeah, thanks. So it, I, I thought it would be a great idea. I'd interview some millionaires whose names you wouldn't recognize to show the reader that success is so much closer than we think it is. And millionaire is so much closer than we think it is. So why do you think that success ex experts get it so wrong? Well, because I went into the interviews trying to validate the hypothesis of find your passion, find your success, which is what I heard. I found if I had heard from many, many experts about goals, plans, and passion. And if you have those things, you'll be successful. And then if you're determined. Well, on the third interview, I asked Matt, who had just sold his business for multi-million dollars, what's your passion, Matt? And almost without hesitation, he said, I, I don't really know. I've never had that conversation with myself. Yeah. I don't know if I caught it in the interview, Ramey, but afterwards I looked at it and I said, he didn't have goals. That was another thing. He said, no, I, don't, I didn't really have goals. And he didn't really know what his passion was, yet he had just sold his business for multi-million dollars. And so I thought, maybe there's more than what the experts are telling us or maybe what they're telling us isn't really the truth. And what I found by interviewing these 21 millionaires is that most of them didn't create success the way the gurus tell you you have to. Mm -hmm. So after being a disciple of those gurus, I learned the truth that they're not really giving us the full deal, the real deal. I, I don't know why, I don't know what it is, but they're not telling us how people really create success, how ordinary people create extraordinary success. Maybe they're just really good with their promotions and so we all believe them. <laughs> Uh, that may be true. That may be true. <laughs> they have good marketing people, <laughs> and so we buy into it. <laughs> In my book, I call it uh, the tightly packaged, hyperbole filled, very well marketed systems. <laughs> yeah. That's great. So, what made you want to write this book? I had known for years that I wanted to write a book, and I just didn't know what I would write about until I came across that thought of find your passion, find your success. And I had wanted to write a book because I wanted to inspire other people, like these gurus were inspiring me. Yeah. I thought, I, I need to share a message with people in a broad way. I need to help other people. But I didn't want to be one of those guys who just regurgitated what everybody else said. I wanted to have done something significant. I look at Stephen Covey, one of the gurus for whom I still have respect and, and still think his stuff is solid. And the way he came to write Seven Habits is he took the sabbatical, he studied the success literature, and so he had learned something significant that he then shared. Mm -hmm. So I didn't want to be one uh, a guy that's uh, one of those other guys that just studies what other successful people do and then regurgitate that from stage. I didn't want to be that guy. Yeah. Yeah, we know some of those guys. They stand up and they just uh, spiel off a bunch of quotations. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, Larry Winget, who's a very successful author, he talks about how he used to do that. And he was very good. He was making seven figures as a public speaker. And then he said, I just realized I was a sellout. I wasn't true to myself. And so I stopped telling people, set your goals and be nice to people. He said, I just put the earrings back in, the plaid shirt back on, and I was Larry, and now I just tell it like it is. <laughs> I love that. So when you started with your book, did you know that you were going to interview millionaires, or did it kind of morph on its own? 
No, I did. After I read that quote of find your passion, find your success, I had the idea to interview 21 millionaires. So I knew it was millionaires at that point. Yeah. And I, I had wanted actually what I call bank account millionaires, people who had a million dollars in the bank. I didn't really want to look at some asset millionaires, but through the process of the millionaires that I came to and the, the ones that popped up and came into my life, I thought, boy, they had such fascinating stories. I better include those too. Yeah. So where did they, where did you find them? Did they just show up to you or did you go looking for them? Yeah, both really. Uh, it, very interesting. I interviewed one of them because I knew him from church, and so I started there. It was a logical place. And then I put the project on the shelf for a year because I got a contracting job, and they had an intellectual property agreement that I didn't want to mess with. And yeah. I would have been fine, but I didn't want any questions whatsoever. Yeah. So after that project ended, it was a contract. After it ended, I then was talking to Gina Schreck, who was the president of the Colorado Speakers Association, mm -hmm. and she said, you need to talk to Ashley Andrus. And it, it was interesting because Ashley isn't somebody that really could have booked me, isn't really somebody that could have promoted me because she takes on established speakers, established authors. She's a Speakers Bureau uh, president. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, as I met with Ashley, contrary to what I normally would have done, I shared with her the idea. Normally, I wouldn't have shared those kinds of ideas because I want to hold them close to my chest. Yeah. I thought, I don't want anyone to steal my yeah. idea. Or, <laughs> I don't want anyone to ridicule me because I, I was a young guy and I thought, I don't know much about business. I don't know anything. And I, I just didn't want to be ridiculed. But for some reason, this came open and I shared with her the idea for the book. Right away, she said, I know who you need to talk to. So she referred me to, I think it was three or four millionaires right away. She told her friend about it who referred me to one. And it kind of went from there. And then I looked at my network to see if there were others I knew. I had friends refer me to some and some I just made cold calls and said, hey, I found your name on the internet. I'm writing a book about millionaires. Would you be interested? Yeah. And kind of amazingly, they said, yeah, sure, absolutely. You know, it, it surprises me because I would wonder, do they not want people to know that they're millionaires? Would they hold that kind of in secret? Or, or once you have that much money, are you willing to broadcast it everywhere? <laughs> And that's the interesting thing is, just like in The Millionaire Next Door, these people aren't necessarily ones that want everybody to know that they're millionaires. They don't broadcast it. Millionaire 15, Cynthia McKay, for instance, she said, I dress like a pauper. Nobody knows. Yeah, yeah. until but, you get into print. <laughs> it, exactly. And, and a million or more people know. And therefore, because of that, I had as many millionaires decline to be interviewed as I, as I, I had accept because they didn't want to be known as a millionaire. Even some of the ones that um, are in the book were a little shy, standoffish, and say, are you going to put my name with this? And one of the reasons for that is they didn't want people to think, I'm an expert, I know what I'm talking about. They just, in their mind, are so humble and, and think to themselves, what could anyone learn from me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that some people would be afraid of being sued, you know, because you do have those people in the world that go after people with money. Right. Or, you know, maybe they're currently trying to work a deal that, that the people out there in, in society, they don't want them to know this deal that they're working on. It's too much information. But did you yep. interview some of these people and at least leave them anonymous? No. Everyone that I interviewed, I used name and uh, their story because I wanted the yeah. reader to be able to go to the website and learn more about, for instance, Millionaire 17, Brian Willis, and learn his background and what is this title company that he started. and. Yeah. And maybe even drive some business to these folks. Yeah. Uh, that would be nice for them yeah. because they put themselves out there on the line. And and I honestly, I did worry, Ramey, about you know personality, um, letting these people's personal lives come out, and how they would handle that. But they're so down to earth, yeah. so real that they thought, well, if I do have something, sure, I'm willing to help. Mm -hmm. So, what was the most surprising thing you learned? Was it something from one person, or was it an overall lesson that you came away with? Yeah, it's hard to encapsulate the, the one thing I learned uh, it, because there's the process of writing a book that teaches you a whole lot. Then there's the process of interviewing these folks that taught me a whole lot. The, the number one thing that I learned is that the success experts are wrong. Mm -hmm. So take back their CDs. Don't go to those seminars. Get your money back, all that kind of good stuff because the real truth about success is that it's not about glamour mm -hmm. and it's not even about discipline. Mm -hmm. it, it's not those two extremes that we hear about. Mm -hmm. It's a really roll up your sleeves, just do what makes sense in the moment. Don't worry about outcomes. Just work hard at whatever you're doing. Mm, that's that's interesting. interesting. Yeah. yeah. That's the interesting thing about we hear this discipline thing of set your goals and work at it with discipline. And if you don't reach it, well, then you're a failure. That's kind of the message that we get. But these millionaires didn't even have an end goal in mind for the most part that they were working toward. Yeah worked and as they worked opportunities opened up to them 
that made sense to where they could look back on it and say, oh, that, that turned into something pretty special. You know, I, I interviewed someone in my book um, who was a top sales person. I, she was like number three in the state or something. I forget her ranking. But I asked her, do you ever set goals? And she said, never. She said she's never written a business plan that if her numbers ever begin to come down, she only looks at one thing. How am I showing up in the world? Bingo. Yeah. So she only looked at, at her own, you know, moral code as her guiding post. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I'm like you. I would think that people would just set these goals. I'm going to be a millionaire by the time I'm 32, you know, yeah. that sort of thing. And some of them did. A couple of them had, I want to be a millionaire by 30 or a millionaire by 40. But it wasn't that they said that and then put a plan in place to get there. That was just kind of in the subconscious, kind of like that lady that you interviewed. That, How am I showing up in the world? For them, it was just kind of, okay, am I doing things that are going to lead me to where I really want to be? And it's not like they said, I really want to have a million, so am I making those choices? It was really this subconscious, mm -hmm. very demure, down-to-earth process. Mm -hmm. Even when you look at somebody like uh, Oprah Winfrey, I mean, she didn't have these you know, huge goals when she was a young child. She yeah. stayed true to what she believed in, and even in the face of all the talk show, do um, you remember back so many years ago when everybody was a talk show host? Yeah. And she refused to get into the controversy and the drama it, on stage and all that. She just stayed very true to what she wanted. But she never, ever had a goal to become a legend. Right. Yeah. And, and how could you? Millionaire to Jeffrey Luftig, he said, I asked him, did you ever see your business growing to the level it did or having the success you did? He said, well, it would have depended on when you asked me. Going into it, no. I saw it as a way to make some quick money and provide for my children's education. But it morphs along the way. He said he used the term significant amount of money in a short amount of time. And he said, but significant changes along the way. Yeah. And then he, he said his next statement was 35 to 40 uh, employees throughout the world, satellite offices flying around in my own airplane. No, I didn't see that happening. There was no way I could have planned for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. When the opportunity shows up, you certainly do want to be ready for it. <laughs> right. No, no, I don't think I want to fly on a private plane. <laughs> Exactly. But he never had this goal of when I'm 45, I'll be owning my own consulting company, making a hundred million dollars and I'll own my, I'll fly in my own plane. It, that wasn't in his cards. Yeah. What was in his cards was make a significant amount of money, pay for his children's education. Yeah. And then it was, okay, let's service this client. Let's service this client. All right, let's open a satellite office. That makes sense. Yeah. Let's hire some employees. And suddenly it's only after 14 years that you look back and say, that changed a little bit. Yeah. Now, what do you think about the idea that these people um, stayed on top of things as opposed to sabotaging their efforts? Did you see a real distinction in their character? Tell me more about that. Well, you know how some people have, have dreams and aspirations and passions and they have a really big why, but they end up sabotaging themselves at every turn? Yeah. Because of some misguided, uh, you know, it might be an old moral principle, it might be some family member. But they have, they have this rock star quality within them, but they keep sabotaging their efforts. Did you find that your millionaires that you interviewed, just sabotage was never part of their formula? Boy, that's a great question. Yeah. That's something I'll have to think about. Yeah. My off the top of the head answer to that is because these people were always working hard at whatever they did, they got affirmation early on that if they worked hard, good things would happen. Mm -hmm. Millionaire 18, Sean Kane said, I grew up watching my parents work hard and understood if you work hard, you can have anything you want in this world. And so, and Millionaire 8, Barry Hamilton says, I had some early wins in sports and music and my parents helped reaffirm me that way. And so I would guess that based on having those early wins and those good successes in life, they never had to practice positive affirmations. That wasn't something that they consciously did. And I think part of the reason for that is they already had it within them. Now, there's others of us that had early losses, and uh, we see ourselves as wondering, gosh, can I be successful? Where is it? Like I told you, for seven to ten years, I beat my head against the wall. Where is success? Yeah, what yeah. am I doing? What am I doing wrong? Yeah. Um, it, at the same time, I'll tell you that these folks, aren't they don't have the Midas touch. It's not like everything they touch turned to gold. Mm -hmm. One guy failed in business six different times before he finally had a successful business. Mm -hmm. One guy's gone broke four or five times. Uh, Matt Given, millionaire number three, he was working a chairlift for a buck or for a quarter over minimum wage at a ski resort <laughs> and he had an MBA. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So roundabout paths, roundabout ways, but I would say throughout it all, they probably just kind of understood with this calm understanding, 
if you work hard, good things come. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you can't you can't blame it on experience or evidence. You know, a, a lot of uh, life coaches like to say, look at the evidence that you do have yeah. these little successes, and some people instead look at the evidence that they have failures. Right. So, so the evidence or the experience isn't stopping them, and I, I have to wonder if you're onto something there about their passions, knowing what's important to you in life, and keeping your nose to the grindstone. It, it's almost as if I've often thought about this. When you are working on vision boards and affirmations, are you, by doing that, affirming that you don't have success and that's why you're trying to change it? That could be. Yeah. Millionaire 14 Doug Krug said that goals are often the very obstacle to getting it. I said, tell me more about that, Doug. What do you that's mean? interesting. Yeah. And uh, he said, for instance, when I was young and single, I had the goal to be happy and be in a happy relationship. So when I saw a couple in a park together, what did I feel? I felt envy and lack that I didn't have that. Mm -hmm. So my goal was affirming what I didn't have. Mm -hmm. So you may be right with that. I, I love that. I love that. I've been guilty of that, looking at what I don't have instead of what I do have or looking at what's wrong instead of what's right. Yeah. Oh, man, that, that's huge. So it is. I want to ask you um, the five secrets of entrepreneurial millionaires. I'm going to ask you that in a minute, though. First yeah. of all, I want to ask you, who is your favorite millionaire? It kind of surprises me that you're able to say millionaire number 12, you know, and then rattle off a name. That's kind of cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, who was your favorite? Um, all of them. They really were. I, I love the interviews with all of them. Each of them taught me something different. And there were some millionaires that I didn't really connect with. Oh. We have different personalities, different ways of approaching life. And yet I'm so grateful that they shared their story with me because I hope that readers will connect with them. Yeah. I realize that my target audience is a lot like me, somebody who's trying to be successful, thinks they're relatively, at least decently, smart and can figure things out, but just can't figure out why is this not working for me? Where is success? What do I need to be doing? Yeah. Um, so I think that some of the target market, by the way, I found out I'm anything but, I say in the book, I used to think I was charming, handsome, and smart, and I would have, the world would open up to me, and <laughs> I've since figured out I'm neither one of those three. <laughs> I just need to work really hard at whatever I do. But So I think some of my target market is me, but I understand that a lot of the target market is not and will really, they'll resonate better or different millionaire stories will resonate better with them than resonated with me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So uh, there are millionaires like Millionaire 5, Heidi Ganahl, Millionaire 16, Lane Nemeth, whose stories are just absolutely fascinating. Death of a spouse, death of business partners, the things that they worked through and went through. Millionaire 17, Brian Willis, who talks about, I didn't really even have to do anything throughout my career. I just had the table set and I just had to eat. And he says that, but you learn that he worked 80 to 100 hour weeks in corporate America to set himself up for success. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then there's people like millionaire one Lee Carlson who got into real estate, oh, because I can make more money this way. Mm -hmm. And I want my family to be around me. So there's all kinds of things you can learn from all these different millionaires. And I hope the reader really picks that up, that maybe they learn a thing or two from some. Maybe they really resonate with others. And maybe some they go, I didn't learn a thing from that person yet. They're a millionaire? <laughs> How'd that happen? <laughs> How'd that happen? Exactly. Did you ask each of these millionaires, what's your one secret to success? Or did you have any, any um, fluidity? No, that's not the right word. Any common question that you asked each one? Yeah, I had common questions that I asked. I, I went into each interview with about 40 prepared questions. The first interviews, maybe I had 25 or so prepared questions, and then it morphed. And I came into it with more prepared questions. But at the same time, I wanted the real truth about success, and I wanted their story. So I let each interview unfold naturally, which is really interesting because one of the things that I found out about how these millionaires created success is that they let things unfold naturally. Mm. And I was doing that throughout this process, but yet I was worried too at the same time. And I talked to a friend and I said, Eric, I, I don't know if I should ask all the same questions or if I need to just roll with each interview. And in essence, he said, Brandon, just go with it. Yeah. And Millionaire 5, Heidi Ganahl said the same thing. She said, just tell the story how you think you ought to tell it and it'll work out. So I yeah. came, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, if you were doing research, then you would want all 40 questions answered, but you weren't looking for research. You were looking more for inspiration. Yes yeah. and yes and no. Yeah. I came at it with that hypothesis, but I'm by no means a researcher. I'm no PhD. I did want anecdotal evidence. Mm -hmm. I did want common questions. So I, I did end up asking maybe the same five or ten questions of everybody. Mm -hmm. And so I got different perspective from different millionaires. And I found some commonalities because of that. 
And then the other questions throughout the interview, I just let happen naturally and unfold naturally. And I, I asked each of them, I probably ended up asking each of them anywhere from 21 to 50 or 60 different questions. And then I chopped it down into the book to make it more palatable and readable. Yeah. Did anybody ever say enough with the questions already? <laughs> no, nobody did. That's cool. After, after about two hours and 15 minutes though, sometimes we had to say, okay, that's, that's probably enough for today. Yeah. Yeah. So, it wasn't that they were itching to, to move on. In fact, most of them were very happy to spend the time. And um, and it wasn't as if they, they felt honored that they were part of this book, but they were just real people sharing, if you want to know, here's what I got. Yeah. Maybe you can use it, maybe you can't, but I'm happy to spend some time with you. They probably wish they'd had mentors to do the same for them. One of them did. Millionaire 20 Rob Emmerich, he said, I really wish that I had some better mentors in social entrepreneurship yeah. because that's just not there. Yeah. And I said, well, you know, Rob, actually none of these millionaires had a formal mentor. They all had maybe groups of people or one or two people that they would rely on, but it's not as if they said, this person's my mentor and I'm their mentee and I come to them when I need advice. They were really informal. So what did you learn, aside from letting things unfold, what did you learn from interviewing 21 millionaires? Yeah, so those are maybe those, those five secrets, or yeah. I call them the four commonalities and the bonus commonality that the millionaires share. Number one, work hard. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I don't know that I came into the interviews, I certainly didn't actually come into interviews knowing I would learn that that was one of the things that made them successful. It was through the interviews that I was able to see and realize these people worked hard whatever they were doing. 17 of them have a bachelor's degree or higher. 19 of them have some college or more. So they worked hard no matter where they were, no matter what they were doing. Uh -huh. I, and I, I bring up education to show that even in their young life, they understood work hard now, things will happen later. Some of them had paper routes or John Simcox, Millionaire 12, was a farmer and he went down to the city market or city square and sold corn there and all kinds of different things. So they all worked hard. They continue to work hard. Whatever it is they're doing, they just put in the effort. And did, did any of them mention that um, you want to let your money work for you? Or was, was there a point where they shifted from working hard to letting their money work for them? Any comments about that? No, none. They in fact, work hard. they still work hard. Yeah, in fact, uh, Millionaire 21, Richard Zuschlag, he is the chairman of Acadian Ambulance, a very successful ambulance company in Louisiana, and they've branched out into Texas. And uh, The man at any point could say, thank you, it's been fun, I'm done. But he continues to work hard mm -hmm. because he loves the people he works with and wants to make a difference for them. Mm -hmm. And that's a very similar story with a lot of these millionaires is they love the people they work with. Millionaire uh, 19, Judith Briggs, talks about how these are her family. Her employees are family to her. She loves being around them and being with them. Mm -hmm. And so maybe some have slowed down in their later years. Yeah. But you could, their slowing down is probably most people's full out effort. <laughs> now, what do you think now that you've interviewed them and, and looked at their success? Do you think, um, uh, do you think they have a passion for what they are currently doing or that they found their life purpose? Or do you think it really is this work ethic? In other words, could they pick up another business and be just as successful? Both. It's absolutely both. Millionaire 18, Sean Kane put it best when he said, I fell into the profession that I'm in and it became my passion. Oh, wow. Okay. Again, I had heard you have to find your passion. You have to know what you're passionate about. Then you can be successful. And in fact, I spent some time thinking to myself years and years ago, what is my passion? What is my passion? And for a while, I thought, well, it's helping people live healthy lives. So it's nutrition and it's proper um, education and it's exercise and things like that. Well, that's actually not my passion. That's something I like to do. Yeah. But what my passion, my real passion is helping people and spreading the truth mm -hmm. about how they can be successful. So how did I find my passion? I fell into it. Mm -hmm. by writing this book. I was down another track and thinking something else would be my passion. So these folks, by working hard, found that passion. Now, Millionaire 17 Brian Willis says, in essence, through the conversation, it kind of comes out that, yeah, working hard is his passion. Mm -hmm. That's what he's passionate about. So it doesn't matter what business he was in. And in fact, he, he was in finance, and then he went into a different kind of a role within a company. And then he went into the title insurance industry, and then now he's a business owner. 
So it, it really doesn't matter for some of these people, and they've been successful in different businesses because their passion isn't their passion isn't that one thing that they're doing. Their passion is multifaceted and multipersonality, as John Simcox, Millionaire Twelve, put it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what I found in, in my work is that you can have a passion, <clears throat> excuse me, a passion for playing tennis, but that doesn't mean it's your purpose in life. That's kind of the distinction yeah. that I draw. Yeah. Great. Yeah. That's really good. Mm -hmm. Millionaire 16 Lane Nemeth comes to mind. The reason that she started, she's, uh, she's the founder of Discovery Toys, if you remember the, yeah. the company Discovery Toys. Yeah. The, the reason she started that was she had an overwhelming burning desire to make the world a better place for her daughter through educational toys and spreading the knowledge of how to use educational toys to create a better generation and that's what she was totally passionate about but it's not as if she thought to herself this is my passion what can I do no she tried to buy educational toys for her daughter I'm sorry I've, I've just uh, my computer cut out right you're there okay. hang on you're alright you look fine from here okay good um, so she had this passion to get some education or not even a passion she had this drive to get some educational toys for her daughter Tara she was told that she could not because you could only buy them from an educational institution and she didn't have the proper credentials to do that and blah, blah, blah. And she said it made me mad. Yeah. So I figured out a way to make it happen. And it was that burning desire to create a better world for Tara that put her on the path that she was on. Yeah, yeah. I love that. It's a fine line between anger and a burning desire. <laughs> right. It's it a very sure fine is. Line. Yeah. Yeah, and she's a very passionate, very emotional person. Yeah, yeah. And I asked her about that. I said, you, you're very passionate, very opinionated. Has that helped or hurt? She said, it's, it's helped. A strong opinion is good for a CEO, but I also listen. Yeah. And not afraid to engage in discussion and change my mind when somebody brings information that's helpful. Mm -hmm. That's good. That's good to know. So number one is work hard. What would number two be? Number two, I call it line upon line. Or some people might think of it as step by step. Line upon line makes the most sense to me because, again, these people didn't begin knowing where the end goal would be, or they didn't have something they were even shooting toward. Mm -hmm. Again, Lane Nemeth, Millionaire 16, it's not as if she said to herself, I will sell Discovery Toys for millions of dollars to the Avon Corporation after X amount of years. Yeah. It just wasn't in her mind. Instead, she said, I need to buy educational toys for Tara. How can I do that? Mm -hmm. Okay, there's a toy show coming up. Maybe I should go to that toy show and see what they have. Oh, they don't have anything. It's all garbage. Okay, how can I create some toys then? Uh, okay, now how can I market some toys? Now that I have a few toys, how can I market those toys? Um, now that we're selling some of these toys, I guess I better get in some management in here who can really work this thing for me. So it was that step-by-step, line-upon-line progression of... All right, we're here. What's the next piece? Okay, how do we get there? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that by that means, life unfolded naturally. Yeah, and that's what used to frustrate me about goals was I only made three goals in my life ever come true, and maybe a couple more now, but uh, which was getting my degree, writing a book, and things like that. But but before that, the only goals I ever were able to have come true, one of them. The rug got pulled out from underneath me because it was a financial goal, and then at work they changed our commission structure. I was a sales manager. They changed the commission structure so I couldn't make that money anymore. Yeah, it was so disheartening. And people yeah. say, "Well, did you reset the goal?" I said, "No. What would I reset it to? Less money? Yeah. I couldn't feel good about that, but that's the reality of where I would have been." Yeah, so many people beat themselves up in the last few years because of the economy, as if they were in control of what the economy did. You, you got know, it. sometimes you find yourself under a market condition that you really didn't, you know, didn't control. There you go. And Millionaire 11, um, Mark Sanborn, he talked to a guy who's in infomercials and the guy said, in essence, what can we do with this housing market thing? We didn't create the mess, but what can we do? And so they're doing programs on foreclosures and things. Yeah. And the way that Sanborn puts it, he said, they didn't create the mess, but they figured out how to roll with it and how to make money in it. And if we could all do that, if we could all just, get, we don't, if, if we're locked into these goals and these plans, we're not aware enough to take advantage of situations around us. Millionaire 20 Rob Emmerich, who is a planner, and he does start everything with a plan, is also aware enough to say to himself, maybe this plan needs to change, or maybe the goal needs to change, and doesn't yeah. lock himself in. It's the classic, can't see the forest for the trees. Bingo. So if you That's keep one eye on the goal always, to me, you almost need to be um, flexible enough to change your vision as you go. Yes. Yeah. That's exactly right. Based on what you see from the new perspective. So that's number two, line upon line. 
I'm going to write 2A, change your vision as you go. <laughs> right. I'm glad you, you brought that up. And then number three was mistakes were never mistakes. I call it move forward through course correcting. I've heard, I don't know if it's true, that a plane is off course 97% of its journey and it's constantly course correcting, just minor corrections. Mm -hmm. And uh, I learned from these millionaires that failure hardly ever existed in their mind. They say, yeah, I failed at business. Or Millionaire 19, Judith Briggs said, you could say I failed at two marriages. But she said, I appreciate you asked the way you asked the question, which was, what have you learned from your failures? I didn't ask, what have you failed at? I asked, what did you learn from your failures? She said, I appreciate the way you asked the question because you could look at it and say that my two marriages failed, but I, I have wonderful children that I was able to, to uh, gain, and I'm in this business because of my second marriage. I wouldn't be in the business I'm in without that marriage. Yeah. So, yeah, some things don't work out. Other things come of it. Mm -hmm. And a, a quick side note there is that most of these people were actually really good at balancing time with their families while they were building the business because you would think oh they were so dedicated and they were so head down that they pushed other people away and for the most part that's just really not the case some of them yeah they had troubles with balancing and but for the most part they worked hard but then they were able to balance pretty well so uh, but back to the corrections piece and the failures piece the millionaire 18 Sean Kane he simply said I, I said what have you learned from your failures he laughed and he said frustration <laughs> And then he said, I've just learned that there's a better way to do something. If one way doesn't work, it's just showing me that there are other ways for it to work. And to that point, it's not as if the millionaires kept beating their head against the wall saying there's got to be a way to overcome this. Sometimes they just took a step back and said, well, if this avenue isn't opening up, maybe there's something else I ought to be doing right now. Mm -hmm. And they worked something else until something did work. Well but they never put timelines on things and said this has to happen by this time. For the most part, they just didn't do that. Instead, it was, okay, this opportunity looks right. I'll pursue it. All right, it's not quite working out. Is there something else I should do? Is there some correction I can make to make it work? Okay, maybe not. This isn't really working. Back up. Take a bigger picture. What do I need to do? And they just kept moving forward that way. You know, I'm, I can't tell you how happy I am to hear that because I've never been one to attach a timeline to my goals, which just flies in the face of every goal-setting expert. I, I think I, I must have some past lives where I got executed when I didn't meet a deadline because I, I've just been so opposed to deadlines in this life. You know, it's like I'm going to get there when I get there. I want to, I want to put out a good product. I, want, I don't want to just meet a deadline because it's there. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. So there are some things in life that we just need to do and get it done. Yeah. And deadlines are helpful for that because they force us to just get the thing done when it doesn't need to be perfect. Yeah. Yeah. But then at the same time, if you hold yourself to this arbitrary deadline, you make different decisions. Yeah. What does it mean? I mean, you know. Right. What does it mean? Yeah. Remy, I wanted to have the book done in a year. It took four years. Oh, I, I can. we can talk. <laughs> right? Exactly. Yeah. Every author knows that pain, right? And so one of the millionaire's wives, as she was recommending me, uh, this was Millionaire 7 Vance Andrus. What a fascinating character he is. His wife referred me to Millionaire 21, Richard Zuschlag. They had been acquaintances within the uh, Lafayette, Louisiana community. And she said, well, what's your timeline to finish this thing? And I told her last January. <laughs> that, was, that was years ago that I said my timeline was last January. But then I followed it up with one thing I learned from your husband and these other millionaires is it, 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 don't worry about the timeline. Things will unfold. That's point number two. Things will unfold as they're supposed to unfold, mm -hmm. and you just roll with it. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean I don't get frustrated. Doesn't mean I don't want to have things happen in a certain time frame. But I'm not in total control. Yeah, I don't. I don't set my goals by timelines. I may. I may plan up my week for what I want to get done on a timeline. But yeah. yeah, sometimes there's something magical that, that needs to happen or some connection that you need to make that they're not ready to connect with you yet or some piece that you're missing. I mean, my I don't know about you, but my book morphed through three different, completely different personalities before the actual thing came to the surface of what it was supposed to be. Really? Yeah. So if I'd stuck with my original deadline and my original concept and my original title, it, I mean, it, it would have been yeah. a flop and there, there would have been one more failure on my plate. There you go. <laughs> yeah. And one more temptation to look at it and say, well, maybe I'm not supposed to write a book. Yes, and, yeah, yeah. All right, so we've got work hard, line yep. upon line. Um, I put in my own change of vision as you go, so don't let me quote that. Mistakes are not mistakes, and we're ready for number four. Number four, unique path. 
Good. Boy, I used to get so frustrated, Remy, when I would read the success advice. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that after a while, I, I kind of figured out two different things happened in those books. Number one, they prescribed step by step, this is what you need to do. Mm -hmm. And that didn't work for me. Or number two, it's so vague in general, like, have a positive attitude. Uh, <laughs> the right it, mindset. <laughs> right. Get good at networking. Yeah. It's your stinking thinking, those kinds of things that are so broad and vague that, okay, I guess if I'm positive, good things will happen. Attract things into your life that you want, you know, the attraction theory. And yeah. and that, neither one worked for me. I I wrote down what I would do with a half a million dollars. I wrote down what I would do with a million dollars. I was told you probably never have a half a million or a million dollars if you don't know what you would do with it. So I wrote down, what would I do with it? And so in these success advice and success books and CDs and all that kind of stuff, they can tend to prescribe a path and say, if you do X, Y will happen. Mm -hmm. Millionaire 20, Rob Emmerich put it so well when he said, a lot of people in life want that. A lot of people in entrepreneurship want that. If I do X and Y, Z will happen. And he said, life's just not like that. And entrepreneurship is certainly not like that. That's, and it, see all these four points, they tie together. That's that line upon line and course correction through, or mistakes aren't mistakes. And you just course correct and move forward. They found their own unique path, all of these millionaires did, because they didn't try to follow somebody else's blueprint for success, which is actually what I was trying to do when I started writing the book. I wanted to give other people a blueprint. One of the, one of the uh, success gurus whose stuff, I, there's some of his stuff I still kind of like, but he said, success leaves tracks. Yeah. And it always made sense to me. And I thought if I can follow those tracks, I'll be successful. Yeah. But it's not as if I can pattern my life. And that's why I'm very careful in the book. I say these are commonalities the millionaires share. I don't even call them traits yeah. because I don't want somebody to say, okay, if I do this, if I do this, if I do this, boom, I'll be successful, Yeah. which is actually point number five. Wait a minute. Before you go there. I know. We didn't it's the unblueprint <laughs> that you need to follow. Exactly. I like that. But you know, they took their own unique path to success. Yeah. It's not as if somebody could look at their story and say, oh, okay, I can do what Millionaire 15 did, Cynthia McKay, because I can do this and this and this. Yeah. You can't because her story is unique, her path is unique, and it's supposed to be. Yeah. God put us on this planet as unique people, and we're supposed to fulfill unique missions. You know, when I, when I was doing my interviews, I, I started off – interviewing regular people to find out what they wanted to know from the super successful. So yeah. I too had my list of 40 and 50 questions that I was trying to, to work on. And as I was interviewing the top salespeople and other you know successful people, I, I noticed they won't answer my question. And I began to see this uh, pattern where uh, what I called it beingness versus doingness. They didn't yes. want to talk about, here's what I do, because you can't possibly emulate me and expect to have the same success. But right. when you know who you are in your heart, when your beingness is squared away, when you have a, a moral code or whatever's important for you, that's yeah. where the success is going to come. And that, that to me was a fascinating turn. That was my third morph. That's when I knew, knew what the book was supposed to be about. There you go. And you wouldn't have gotten to that point without being open to that yeah. and paying attention to what you were hearing and the feedback you were receiving from these people. But what sent you on that quest was that genuine curiosity yeah. and that desire to help other people. Yeah. But you know what I'm thinking, Brandon, this is interesting. So many of us these days live in tracked homes. I know yeah. I do. It's a beautiful home, but it's a tracked home. But you right. think about that one house up the street that's a custom home right. that did not have the same blueprint as everyone yeah. else. Isn't yeah. it usually the more beautiful home? Of course it is. It's unique. Yeah. So, yeah. and yet in our lives, we try to pattern off of other people. Now, some of that isn't bad because we, we want to know what is success? How do you become successful? And if we can emulate some of those things, okay, we want to do them. Yeah. But if that gets in the way of paying attention to what life is trying to tell you, if that gets in the way of what that inner spirit, that guidance is trying to tell you, then you're going down the wrong path. Yes. It's almost like we're trained, so many of us, to not listen to our inner voice. How did that happen? Mi millionaire 8 Teresa Zurich or Millionaire 9 Teresa Zurich, it tells us how that happened. In business, in school, we get it beaten out of us. Yeah, yeah. It's an amazing thought. If, if children could just be children and explore who they are and be exposed to so many different things, and yet we tend to want to pigeonhole kids at a, at a very young age. You're so right. Yeah. You're so right. And as you say that, I start thinking, I better not do that with my kids. I'm thinking through consciously, am I doing things to pigeonhole them? I yeah. hope not. 
Well, you know, I've told the story before uh, about a fellow that I interviewed who, who well, um, he's the one I mentioned earlier that also has five children. Yeah. Uh, very successful financial planner. But he said when he was very young, I think he said he was seven or eight, he went to his dad who was sitting in his easy chair and said, Dad, why are we here? And his dad like crushes his beer can and says, don't bother me, boy, and shoes him away. So he goes into the kitchen and asks his mom, why are we here? And his mom said, oh, honey, don't question God. And he said at a very young age, he had this had this question, but nobody would answer it. So you fast forward, he gets into high school, he joins the ROTC, he goes off into the military when he's a young man, where you lose all your self-identity. With your, right. your same shaved head and you have to flip a quarter off your bed like everyone else. You're not allowed to think for yourself. You follow orders. You get this training. And when you come out of the military, what are you going to do with that training? Well, now you're going to go get a job because you're trained. And before you know it, you become very robotic. Yeah. And he said the thing is, he said at his age, which has got to be, I think he's in his late 40s, early 50s now. He said, I don't have the luxury to stop and look at what I'm supposed to do or who I'm supposed to be. Oh, right. You know, I've got this path that I've been on and I can't possibly get off it now. I have a family to support. Right. Yeah. That's uh, I'm so glad you brought that up. That's one of the things that we have these financial realities yeah. and we have these obligations that we need to take care of. And that flies in the face sometimes of these success experts who say, oh, just find your passion and you can be successful. Just turn that into what you want to do and the life will open up and things will happen. And not always. Number one, because that may not be your path. Like you said, you may be passionate about tennis, but that may not be your path or your mission, your contribution in this world. Yeah. Maybe you go volunteer and teach tennis on the weekends. Maybe it's so that you can teach your kids mm -hmm. how to enjoy the sport and learn great things from that. These financial realities do exist and we have to work with them. And that's why I love the stories of these millionaires too, because they didn't just throw caution to the wind and say, oh, I'm going to do what I feel is right and what I really want to do. They just let life unfold naturally back to that point. Yeah, yeah. That's awesome. Now, funny story about that. The millionaire 15, Cynthia McKay, she actually did quit her job as a lawyer mm -hmm. and uh, went home and in essence told her husband, hey, I quit my job. I'm starting a business. Oh, great. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, great. And I thought to myself when I heard her, she had given a previous interview that I listened to where she said that. And I thought, okay, probably not a big deal because her husband was probably working. And so she kind of had that to fall back on. But then in the next part of that interview that I listened to, she said, and we were $200,000 in debt because we're both lawyers. We had just, we had a home mortgage. We had just been married within the year and we had two car loans. Student loans probably, oh gosh, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Student loans, Pegasus. So here's a quick point about the working hard. I've got a friend who's incredibly successful and I keep asking him, Eric, what are you doing? How are you being successful? What are you doing? And he's very humble and his standard answer is about, Brandon, I just do what the Lord asked me to do. I just try to be a good husband, a good father, and it just works out. He blesses me. But at the same time, Eric is also very successful because he figured out how to work hard. He put himself through school, and he graduated with no debt. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, life is going to reward a person who knows how to work that hard and put himself in a position like that to succeed. Yeah. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah. Okay, good. So we have the unblueprint. Yep. Unblueprint. <laughs> I like that. I may have to do another version of the book. Right? <laughs> It'll be part two. Part two. So that's number four. Find your unique path. Are we ready for number five? And, and quick clarification. It's not even find your unique path. It's just follow what makes sense yeah. in the moment. It's not as if they said, what is my path? Where do I need to be? Yeah. It was just, it I'll unfolded. do this. Yeah. Yeah. It folded. Right. Mm -hmm. And then, so number five, which helps tie all of this together, at least seven of the millionaires mentioned, I was fortunate enough to be in the right place at the right time. Oh uh, yeah. You can't capture that. Millionaire seven Vance Andrus does say, he said, they asked Bear Bryant one time, coach, what do you think is the role of success or the role of luck in success? Mm -hmm. And Bear Bryant, a great football coach said, you know, that's funny. You should ask. It seems the better players I recruit, the luckier I get. Hmm. So in other words, you can help create some of your luck by doing the right things. But then, like Millionaire Six Steve Rosedahl talks about, there were guys doing the same thing at the same time he was. He just happened to get a little bit luckier, and his stuff worked out. So well, there's... I'm almost seeing ahead. that you could, you could swap out that word player and say the better choices I make, the better luck I have. There you go. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Because isn't that where bad luck comes from? We start with one stupid choice <laughs> that we wish we hadn't made. 
Yeah, sometimes it does. Yeah. You, you know, in this life, and this kind of encompasses all of what we've been talking about today, in this life, there are a couple of different sources of opposition. Number one is our own choices. Mm -hmm. And so if we're making bad choices, yeah, we're going to experience opposition that we then have to fight against and work through. But then number two, part of this world and the whole reason that we're here is to learn and grow through opposition and to become better by facing that opposition. Mm -hmm. We need that opposition. It's not as if somebody gets cancer that they were a bad person and oh, they didn't, they're not in the right place at the right time. No, it's just part of what needs to happen in their journey, in their path, etc. And so if we discount those sources of adversity, and if we discount the sources of luck, then we may not, we may be shortchanging it. So yeah, we can create some luck through choices, but then others, life just has to unfold and, and put your put you in circumstances that really work out that you could never have planned for like millionaire two Jeffrey Luftick says I could never have planned for it to work out like this but that's the way it worked out mm -hmm. I kind of I kind of go by the thought that those oppositions those distractions and those choices that show up are there to help you grow and if you continually choose the bad the bad option it's because you yeah. haven't learned that you haven't learned about that obstacle yet. <laughs> you, you haven't learned how to work past that, right? Yeah, yeah. And it probably, I've heard that those things just keep showing up until we learn how to get past them. I love these. Okay, so work hard but keep balance line by line or line upon line, you said, step by step. Um, mistakes are not mistakes. I love that. Can we give ourselves a break and not beat ourselves up? No kidding, except yeah. that we are. Yeah. Let let's your own, own let's path get and better. Let, let's move forward and let's get better. Let's yeah. not accept when we make a mistake as, oh, that's fine. I can do whatever I want. No, but but accept this is part of the condition. We're, we're going to make mistakes and we'll just yeah. move on. And the mistakes, maybe that's part of that step-by-step. Step. Mm -hmm. you know? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, let your own unique path unfold. Let it just go with it. Let it go. And then uh, be open to opportunities by being at the right place. Let's see. How can we say this? Be open to opportunities so that you're in the right place in the right time so you can see them. Well, I struggled with that too. Yeah. And I asked, how do you find opportunities? And millionaire 15, Cynthia McKay put it the best when she said, until you're in the middle of an opportunity, you don't know what it is. Yeah. Millionaire 18, Sean Kane, when I said, I asked him, I said, when all of this was happening that set you on the path that you're on now, did you know that it, you were taking advantage of an opportunity? He said, no, I had no idea. So I struggled with that. Yeah. It's not as if I can tell the reader, be open to opportunities. Because that doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. It's not as if I can tell them to be in the right place at the right time. Because yeah. no, how do, my, how do you know what that is? <laughs> exactly. How do you know what that is? Yeah. And so it's by doing those first four things that maybe the fifth thing will happen. Yeah. Maybe you will get lucky enough that you'll be in the right place at the right time, in your own unique path. That can really propel you toward that success. And guess what? If you're not, and if you struggle all of your life, and it's a financial grind all of your life. Maybe that was your unique path. Yeah, it's true. You know, I interviewed somebody. Uh, his name is Tom Moore, and he wrote a book called The Gentle Way. He is an yeah. angel expert, which is not the kind of interview I typically do. But what caught my attention is that he says he has the one spiritual tool that's the most important, and that is to always ask your guardian angel for the most benevolent outcome. Yeah. For yourself and everyone around you. And he says the way it works in his opinion is that we have this network of guardian angels for this whole planet and the whole universe, much like a cell phone works in this honeycomb. You know, yeah. you drive down the street and your cell phone's looking for a signal. It jumps from one cell to the next in this giant honeycomb. Right. He feels that your guardian angels work the same way. So you ask for the most benevolent outcome and your guardian angel goes out into the network and finds another guardian angel that can connect these two opportunities. Yeah. So I'm seeing by some of these things about being open to your unique path, you know, being willing to change your vision and all these things, maybe that's how you allow some of these opportunities to come your way. Yeah. Yeah. You, it, there's a lot to be said for being open. My wife put it so well as I was working through the interviews and trying to piece together, what am I learning from these millionaires and what's the message here? Yes. You can imagine with 21 disparate interviews with some same questions, but a lot of different information what am I really learning here? And uh, the way she put it was maybe it's because they weren't locked into goals that they were open to the opportunities that came along. Now I don't tell people not to have goals. Yeah. And I think people can be absolutely successful if they set goals. And if that's what they want to do and they're successful that way, great, go for it. I don't tell people not to have goals. I just report the truth that I learned, which was most of these millionaires didn't have goals. Mm -hmm. 
And a lot of them were then able to take advantage of opportunities that opened up because they weren't locked into a particular path. It's almost like don't don't follow the experts, follow your own heart. You're more of an expert than you realize. Who is the real expert in your life exactly? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, the Holy Spirit will prompt you to do things that you never would have done on your own, that you never could have thought of on your own, and that isn't necessarily out there in the books. Yeah, yeah. Except yours, of course. <laughs> Hopefully it's in mind, exactly. <laughs> I want to write that down. Don't follow the experts. You are your own expert. That's right. I just love taking notes. You would think because I have this on video, I wouldn't feel this obsessive need to take notes, but that's how I learn. I feel the same way. So are there any other last-minute um, secrets or tips that you want to share? Follow your heart. Follow the spirit that's guiding you. And even in my book, I've got four traits the millionaires share, plus the bonus commonality of right time, right place. But the way I sum it up is the book is not the ultimate handbook for being successful. And in fact, on the back cover of the book, I say success is not about reading the right book. And people could look at that and go, well, why should I read your book? Well, because <laughs> it's a little oxymoron-ish, yeah, isn't it? Yeah. The reason that you would read my book is to learn the truth about how each of these 21 individual people, ordinary people, created the extraordinary success that they did. And by viewing through their experience, by viewing success through the lens of what did they do, you may be prompted or see something that you otherwise wouldn't have seen. Yeah. I'm not coming at it from the success expert point of view of X, Y, and Z will give you result Z. I guarantee it. No, there's no way. The only thing I guarantee is to share the truth. That's what I guarantee in my keynotes. That's what I guarantee in the book. You will know the truth. And from there, you can determine, do I need to set goals? Or do I need to be more open to my heart? Or do I need to have a more informal network of mentors and reach out actually when I do need help? Or you'll find that unique path, which I can't tell you. It's almost the experience of awakening. If I can see myself in just one of them or more of them and find out more about who I am and, and get my own truth to surface, well, I've just raised my confidence and raised my own expert level. <laughs> you got it. Yeah. Well, very good. So tell us uh, how to find your book, your web address, and you have a copy of the book with you there? Good. Sure do. Yep. Yeah. The web address is 21for21.com. It's 21for21.com. So numeric 21for21.com. Okay. And you can get the book there. It's an e version, it's in paperback. 21for21.com. This is the book, pictures of millionaires on the front. So you can see they really are ordinary people. In fact, I had a friend tell me, that guy who is a spine surgeon, I, I just thought he would probably look different. He was a very high caliber spine surgeon and millionaire uh, 10, J uh, John Odom, Jackie. Jackie's what goes by Jack Odom. It, when my friend saw him, he said, you know, I just, I thought he would look different. He just is such a down to earth country boy that you wouldn't have expected. Here he is, world renowned spine surgeon. So. That's cool. And they never know who they're influencing. I think it's a great message. No, they never do know who they're influencing. And that's what I appreciate so much about each of them is their willingness to open up and share with me without a, any guarantee even that I would write this thing. Yeah. You said I was going to, and I always hope to write it, but how did they know what it would turn into or how they would be able to inspire other people? And so I hope that they really are able to inspire lots of people who read their story. Well, thank you for playing a role in that. Thank you for doing this project. I think it's a, quite a great idea. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate that, as well as yours is, too. Yeah, thank I'm you. glad it's doing the same thing, inspiring others, and helping them really understand the truth. Yeah. We are, we are living our mission, aren't we? <laughs> uh, I hope so. And it could morph and change. In 10 years, we could be doing something totally different. This is what we're doing right now. And in 10 years, this could have been a, a great platform to set us somewhere else to where we can make the real impact. Who That's knows? Right. You never know. You just never know. you got to stay open. Well, thank you for your time today. We're going to end the call right here, but stay on the line for me, okay? Great. Thanks, Raymond. Thank you.